Hello, my name's Charlie, co-lead of the Chantry Lane Project's Asia-Pacific region and a senior associate in Minter Ellison's climate risk governance team. I'm going to talk about risk, specifically the financial and liability risks associated with climate change. Climate change risks and the opportunities are ubiquitous across most economic sectors and industries. Changes in the climate bring profound risks, not just to our planet and the environment, but to the financial stability and global economy. Although these risks cut across almost every sector, its impacts are differentiated depending on factors such as the relevant markets and the relevant geographies. The Influential Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, the TCFD, has recognised 16 industrial sectors that are at a high risk of material climate related risks. These sectors traverse the vast, econ the vast majority of large economies and include financial services, energy, transport, material and buildings, and agriculture, food and forest products. In addition, the health implications of climate change are widely recognised as being material to companies that are involved in health and human services. A range of Chantry Lane Project's clauses promote TCFD-aligned disclosure. For example, Archie's clause, where an insurer will reduce a premium to a policyholder that makes climate-related financial disclosures in its annual accounts. Or Frank's clause, where investors require a company to report on annual climate-related risks. What are the risks associated with climate change? It has now evolved from a purely ethical, environmental issue to, as before, one that poses significant risks to the global economy. In 2015, Mark Carney, in his then capacity as the Governor of the Bank of England, described the three broad channels through which climate change can affect financial stability. Physical risks, transition risks, and liability risks. One of TCLP's new clauses, Tilly's Clause, sets out a framework de detailing examples of these risks in the context of a prospectus or offering document. In response to the risk posed by climate change, in December 2015, 196 countries signed the Paris Agreement. And under the Paris Agreement, governments have committed to reducing emissions to a level consistent with limiting global warming to well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial averages and to pursue efforts to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. This commitment in turn will require the global economy to transform to operating on a net zero basis before 2050. Net zero emissions refers to achieving a balance between greenhouse gas emissions produced by humans and greenhouse gas emissions removed from the atmosphere. In 2018, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Special Report, Global Warming of 1.5 Degrees C, made clear the imperative of reaching net zero global emissions by 2050 in order to mitigate the catastrophic effects of global warming. In order to reach net zero by 2050, global emissions must be halved by 2030. The IPCC's sixth assessment report published in 2021 reinforced the emerging shift in the focus from net zero by 2050 to interim targets by 2030 and credible transition plans for implementation. For more information on net zero emissions, please see Chantry Lane Project's net zero video and explain the document. As in previous years, the World Economic Forum's 2022 Global Risk Report identified a failure of climate action as one of the greatest risks to the global economy and climate related issues as three of the top six greatest risks. I will now quickly talk about the three broad channels through which climate, risk, climate change poses risks. First, physical. Climate change presents physical risks to the nature and built environment, including the acute risks associated with an increased frequency and intensity of extreme weather events, such as coastal um, inundation and flooding, extreme winds, precipitation, soil contraction, heat waves, drought, and onset impacts such as sea level rise and increasing average temperatures and rainfall. These in turn have significant consequences for ecosystem loss, human health, and the integrity of the built environment and supply chains, including, for example, damage to assets and project delays. Increasing frequency of extreme weather events can heighten the risk of physical damage to assets and associated costs to projects, plants, and equipment. These may have consequences for asset valuation, depreciation impairments, owner's contracts, and end of life provision. Uninsurability of, project, of projects and assets. Climate change can impact insurance coverage and uninsured loss implications, together with additional capital expenditure requirements. In addition, a greater risk profile may lead to a loss of competitiveness in the market and the availability of finance. An example, Connor's clause covers exclusions from insurance coverability for climate liability, costs and losses, occasioned where the insurer has failed to meet greenhouse gas emission targets. 
supply chain disruptions, severe weather events such as extreme participation leading to inland flooding, heat waves and bushfires may disrupt operations and or supply chains. This may affect production, risk business continuity and impact, fulfillment of downstream contract obligations, all of which can impact revenue. TCLP's IRIS's clause provides for draft drafting for contracting parties to work together to balance financial risks and avoid unintended adverse environmental con consequences of such disruptions. The physical risks of climate change are non-linear. They are exponential and the chances may be, the changes may be very abrupt and irreversible. Economic and financial systems have been designed and optimized for a certain level of risk and in the increase in physical risk and uh, the risks associated with climate change are putting those systems under extreme pressure. These are not risks that we can defer until 2030, 2040, 2050. 50, they manifest now in short-term investment horizons and collectively, these physical risks threaten the interests of investors, lenders and other stakeholders. Secondly, economic transition risks. In response to the physical risks associated with climate change, countries around the world have committed to taking action. In order to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, global economies must transition to operating on a net zero by 2050 basis at the latest. Each of the countries that is a party to the Paris Agreement has pledged that they will introduce policies that are consistent with keeping global warming to well below two degrees and striving for that 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. These are referred to as nationally determined contributions or NDCs. Built into the Paris Agreement is a five yearly review and ratchet mechanism. Every five years, countries have, set more, have to set more ambitious emissions reductions targets. The United Nations Climate Change Conference of the Parties 26, COP26, took place in November last year. Postponed from 2020 due to the global pandemic, it was the first five-year review and ratchet period. By the end of the conference, 151 countries had submitted new NDCs, and in recognition of the urgency of the climate crisis, countries agreed to return in 2022 at COP27 with stronger 2030 emissions reduction targets in order to try and close the gap between current emission trajectories and that 1.5 degree goal. If decisive action is not taken immediately, this will result in a disorderly scenario, a scenario where emissions reductions will have to occur very quickly and very sharply with aggressive policy action to reach net zero emissions by 2050. A number of the Chancery Lane Project's clauses include requirements for net zero transition plans so as to mitigate transition risk and encourage smooth, gradual mitigation as early as possible. The disorderly scenario presented by the Network for Greening the Financial System demonstrates the drastic economic impacts in delaying Paris-aligned emissions reductions targets. For example, investments in fossil fuels, coal, mi coal mines, oil wells and power stations, losing all value in a low carbon economy. Fossil fuel reserves and associated asset risks becoming stranded as they receive investment capital but lose the ability to be productive in a low carbon economy. The stranding of environmentally unsustainable assets can be a result of divestment and a rapidly changing regulatory landscape. Limiting the rise in global average temperatures in line with the Paris Agreement requires an unprecedented reduction in global emissions. Such a transition implies the significant structural changes to the economy, including a major reallocation of investment. Economic transition risk arises as governments, capital markets and the real economy shift in the pursuit of low emissions targets. These risks include those policy and regulatory responses, emissions reduction laws, trade laws, tariffs, prudential regulations and heightened planning and building codes. Technological developments in areas such as renewable energy and the electrification of vehicles and shifts in stakeholder preferences, including debt and equity, investors, insurers, tenants and the community. One of the most acute economic transition risks is this shift to net zero emissions. More than 90% of the world economy is now operating under net zero by 2050 policy or laws, with the pressure now having turned to interim targets consistent with a Paris aligned trajectory, broadly 25% by 2025 and 50% by 2030 across all scopes. These emissions reduction commitments are increasingly be, being applied across adjacent areas of regulation, including tariffs and trade and capital regulatory requirements. These notably include the new EU carbon border adjustment mechanism. And from 2026, an equivalency levy will be applied at the EU border on imports of emission intensive products, starting with aluminium, steel, 
fertilizers, cement, and energy. EU importers will buy carbon certificates corresponding to the carbon price that would have been paid under the EU's emissions trading scheme, which in July 2021 traded at around $57 per tonne of CO2, had the goods been produced in the EU. Conversely, a non-EU producer can show that they have already paid a price for, um, for the carbon used in production of the imported goods in a third country. The corresponding cost can be fully deducted for the EU importer. Liability consequences. The sharp evolution of climate change and sustainability into a material financial risk means climate change has now become an acute source of legal risk for both commercial corporations and financial institutions. Liability risks arise from a failure to manage or disclose the physical or economic transition risks. Areas of litigation include director's duties, misleading disclosures in annual reports and fundraising documents, contractual disputes in areas um, from testing the efficacy of force majeure clauses in the context of reason reasonable foreseeability of phys physical risks to pricing pass-throughs and nuisance or negligence, where third parties suffer damage due to a failure of an asset owner to adapt their assets to foreseeable climate-related risks. Climate-related litigation continues to grow in importance as a driver of change and test the bounds of government and corporations' obligations. Cases are now moving towards a wider variety of private and financial actors, including the increased scrutiny in the context of green and or climate washing. Greenwashing claims are increasingly common in three main contexts, being greenhouse gas emission reduction targets, truth to the label claims, and advertising of corporate credentials or products. Opportunities for lawyers. When considering the risks associated with climate change, history is not a valid analog and the risks are not amenable to boilerplate contracts. It is very important for lawyers to understand climate related risks their clients are facing and ensure that the contracts are fit for purpose on a forward looking basis. Lawyers play an integral role in not only advising clients on risks and mitigation strategies, but also in facilitating a client's transition to a low carbon economy through legal drafting. When drafting, consideration must be given to whether a contract undermines or supports a client's net zero target. In order to be your client's best advisor, your legal drafting should remove carbon out of circulation rather than just allocating the risk around the market. The Chantry Lane project has a wide range of contractual clauses spanning the entire legal life cycle to assist with climate risk mitigation and the implementation of climate solutions into commercial contracts. See, for example, Owen's Clause, a net zero target supply chain cascade clause that has back to back or align business net zero targets within a supply chain and business partners enabling the business to achieve its target or take control to achieve its targets. Casper's clause, a model clause as a set of optional riders divided into product categories and ESG goals to incorporate sustainability linked loan principles into traditional financing documents, standard terms and conditions and finance products. And finally, Leela's clause, a board paper for building net zero objectives and targets into corporate strategy for ongoing monitoring and evaluation of a company's progress against its net zero targets.